Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Francesco Guerrero. I'm the head of Barron's Group International, and I'm here as your moderator for this plenary session. We have a tremendous panel to discuss uh, uh, the tension between cloud, AI, and privacy, and, and of course, whether the financial industry can work together to overcome some of the tensions and some of the roadblocks. I'll go very quickly uh, introduce the, the star started uh, panel. I'll start at my far left, Samik Chandarana, who is the manage, managing director and head of analytics and data for JP Morgan Corporate Investment Bank. Uh, next to him, uh, Yves Alexandre de Montjoie, uh, who is an assistant professor at Imperial College London of computing, computing and data science, uh, and also was a special advisor to the European Commissioner Margarete Vestager, European Commissioner for Competition. Uh, next to Yves Alexandre, Andreas Weigen, who is a, a former chief scientist at Amazon.com, company you may have heard of. Uh, and the author of the book, Data for the People. Uh, and then uh, next to me, uh, Puma Kimis, Director, Autom Autonomous Research, who's part of Alliance Bernstein, a former Managing uh, Director, OMFIF, who's an independent think tank focused on central banks. And then last but not least, unfortunately, he could not be with us in person, but he's with us virtually. Uh, and in fact, we can bring him uh, onto the screen right now, uh, Dr. Yang Chiang, uh, who is the chief AI officer of WeBank, a digital bank uh, in China, and we'll, we'll call upon, upon Dr. Yang throughout the discussion to uh, give us his perspective. So welcome, Dr. Yang, and welcome, everybody. So as I said, um, let's set out the issues um, and the issue that we want to discuss. So the thesis of this panel is that there are three pillars, cloud, AI, and privacy, and each b different geographic blocks are leading in different pillars. So the US is leading in cloud, the uh, European Union is setting the pace on privacy, uh, and China is ahead of most other countries on AI. So we'll explore that tension with the panelists and see what the financial services industry can do to overcome this tension. Before we do that, I would like to start with a show of hands here in the audience to see where you guys stand. Uh, so, if we were to ask, who do you think is going to win between privacy and AI? So, who's going to win the race between privacy and AI? What would you say? So, who is in favor of privacy? Who think privacy is going to win? Great. Okay, okay. And who's thinking AI is going to prevail? Artificial intelligence. Oh, oh, interesting. <laughs> interesting from a European panel. Uh, so, that's very interesting. Stay with us, because we'll ask that question again at the end, see if your opinion or perspective has changed. But so far, AI is clearly in the lead. So let me start with you, uh, Sami. Uh, do you see this tension between the three big blocks and the three pillars that we described, cloud, AI, and privacy? Do you see it? Uh, absolutely. So let's start off with one thing. First of all, let's uh, start off with the privacy point. And first of all, have a look at these, the lanyards you all have around you, right? Today, you've all walked in and yesterday, you've been scanned, you've, been, you've got this uh, beacons tracking where you are, you can share even your cards using the little uh, unit behind there. You've already given up a lot of your pri personal privacy with all of these kinds of things that exist. And that's ubiquitous in all of our day lives, right? So we just had, we got used to this point. But as a bank, I have to care slightly differently. You know, we have to think about privacy slightly differently. And this is bearing in mind that our clients are global, our data centers are global. Uh, the businesses we run are completely global. Uh, but we've been built on a bastion of trust uh, for many, many years. And when we think about parts of your life, you don't want your payments data to not be secure. You don't want that type of stuff to be out in the open domain. So we need to sort of think about those challenges that we mentioned very much. And you know, that's going to be the constant challenge between uh, keeping things private and AI. But technology is going to help us here. Um, and the other side that we will also have to think of when we're thinking about privacy, and this is one of the big challenges you will all face, we face, is that data has a very different ruling in every single jurisdiction that we operate in. And as a result of that, we're often having to play the lowest common de denominator game when we're really looking at uh, working with data globally, which is something we have to all bear in mind. But again, let's go back to um, the uh, technology, and I know we're going to go into some of the technology solutions uh, in a little while. Um, but the other side I would also draw people's attention to, while we think about that challenge of just privacy and AI, let's also look at the ethics of data, right? Because 
are we allowed to use the data that we have for some of the purposes that we want to, that we want to do the analysis of and, and actually use that to intelli intelligently automate some of our processes? So that's all the things that we're playing with. We at JP Morgan have spent a long time at looking at some of the tech, uh, technology solutions, as I said before. Secure multi-party compute is one of them uh, that we've been working with a company called Infer for a little while, which uh, seems to solve some of these problems. And you know, I think it's really important that we bear that in mind as we go through the panel and think about these uh, topics. And ultimately, how can I provide services to clients that they will continue to trust? Uh, that, that's got a start. So, Puma, where do you stand as, a, as an observer who is in the financial services industry? Do you agree with something? Do you see that this is the tension that we're facing? I certainly think there's a huge tension that we're facing. Uh, privacy relies immensely on trust. And sadly, being absolutely agree that financial services is the bastion of trust, but not all of the circles, con concentric circles, that come together between corporations, between citizens, and between governments are aligned. Uh, it's not just a jurisdictional issue. Uh, I, I agree with Samik. Uh, I also think it depends on the owners, the agencies of the data. Um, I think in this world, data is global. Uh, connectivity is absolutely critical if you're trying to make some kind of profit. So without connectivity, we're going to be nowhere. Absolutely, there are tensions between AI, between cloud computing, and between privacy. But I was a little startled, if I may say so, with a show of hands around the room earlier between AI and privacy. Uh, I do stand for privacy, uh, and I would like to see that privacy will win. I am glad I'm a citizen in the European Union. I'm glad that permissions for use of my data um, that I may not have allowed for will be curtailed uh, in the event my information, personal information was, was put out there. Um, I'd like to maybe unpack two areas within that question. One is the good guys and the bad guys. Uh, within AI or um, privacy discussions around AI, uh, we've had lots of breaches uh, where I believe everybody in this room should be somewhat aware of the breach we had with the Pegasus software uh, that went around on WhatsApp a couple of years ago, maybe just about 18 months ago. And it was startling. People were surprised that their personal information was drawn down by one click of an open of a chat. Uh, so the basis of what I'm trying to say is privacy will have to be led by permissions by the individual. Uh, it cannot be a decision that's made for with the absence of information. Um, so we've got the bad guys, you know, the creators of Pegasus, whoever they may be, NSO Group or any other firm that might have created the product, but we also have the good guys, CrowdStrike, uh, Sentinel, Silence. There are a number of institutions that are out there uh, trying to protect the data we have. So I'll stop with that just to say that actually technology is not the bad guy, but it's also not the good guy. Um, and it depends on the permissions that we allow for, and that decision has to be made by the private individual. Andreas, you agree? The permission, the decision has to be made by a private individual, and there is a fundamental tension between AI and privacy? Yeah. So first, I don't think it's privacy versus AI. I think it's both which I want. So I don't think it is one or the other. Mm. For the permissions, I think that's a very difficult question because the notion of informed consent, very difficult because nobody is able to read, let alone understand. <laughs> the you know, usage agreement, even if we are forced after we paid for software to then actually lie of saying I've understood, read and understood the usage agreement. So the notion of uh, permissions is very tricky. And I think there my vision is that of having an intermediary. For example, last night I had dinner with Brad Templeton who works at the EFF the Electronic Foundation Foundation. And my vision is that somebody like that will negotiate my permissions on my behalf. And the question I have for you here as an audience is, it used to be that it says, in God we trust. It turns out that 
In a survey one and a half years ago, people turned out to tra trust their banks most. So in banks we trust. Why don't I bring my data to the bank and trust that they will know what to do with it? Like I bring my money to the bank and hope that I get it when I need it. Eva Alexander, so we should trust the banks and the tech companies with our data? Or? It's just something we can do to avoid being robbed of our data. Um, I mean, I think for me, it's more, I mean, certainly there's an element of trust, and I think that's the most important part. I think when you started with, okay, do we need, and that's something that you hear all the time. It's like you need to pick between AI and privacy. You, you can only get one. You pick either you protect your data and our way of life, or we're going to lose in the AI race. And, and that's fundamentally wrong and a false trade-off. And I think we all agree that we don't have to choose. We can truly get both. Like privacy is not about you know, not using data. Privacy is about making sure that we use data properly. And you can truly, and you will have actually a lot more innovation and research in AI if you were to use data properly. Um, let me bring in this, at this juncture, Dr. Yang in, um, if our link works. Uh, so, Dr. Yang, give us a perspective from a financial service practitioner in China. Uh, do you see the same tension? Are there different forces at play? And, and wh what can the financial industry do to help? Right. Um, so, uh, hello, everybody. Um, I don't see AI and privacy as necessarily uh, facing each other off. In fact, uh, if you look at AI as an engine, it's powered by data. Um, but this engine is a function of time. That is, the engine is evolving. Uh, and also, the notion of privacy is also evolving. So it's, we, we should put the perspective on a timeline. Um, so in a sense that if we see uh, data uh, as useful, uh, we should um, be able to power more powerful uh, AI engine to do good things, to do goodness for us. Uh, in financial industry, it can make better prediction and better security. On the other hand, if we see data is threatening us uh, in terms of privacy, we should be able to invent more powerful AI engine which can uh, uh, protect the privacy at the same time. And, and this is indeed what we are doing here at WeBank, is inventing a, a, a new generation of AI engine that protects user privacy. So we can get both world. Uh, understood. Maybe I'll stay with you for a second, then I'll open it to the panel. Uh, when you say protecting privacy, do you accept that there are different definitions of that sentence in different parts of the world. So protecting privacy in the EU is different from the US, is different from China. Uh, I don't think so. I think the, the notion of privacy is universal. Uh, in fact, when we compare the regulations, the data protection regulations in China, which is uh, in the process of being launched, it's uh, in a way, uh, is very much aligned with GDPR. Uh, and uh, in fact, China's uh, law is even more uh, restrictive. Uh, CEOs of uh, companies that violate the laws can be put in prison um, uh, in addition to being fined. So the notion of uh, privacy and the importance of privacy is emphasized the same on both ends. Uh, what's different is we are here actively seeking new technological solutions, such as using MPC, as, as you mentioned, but we are practicing something um, uh, uh, different. Uh, it's called federated machine learning. Federated learning is a way to allow different parties to collectively build a AI engine uh, without having the data uh, exchanged um, between each other. So in other words, the data can stay local, but the model can be built by exchanging some key parameters, but um, the, this uh, parameter exchange can be done in such a way, in a, in a secure way, and, and nobody can uh, peek into other people's data. So in this way, we believe that we can build a new generation of AI system 
that simultaneously satisfy the privacy requirement and can build a powerful AI engine. Thank you, Dr. Yuan. More from you later. Uh, Andreas, please. I'm surprised about the big elephant in the room that you're not addressing. You're saying that COs can and maybe will be put in prison in China. What about the government? What is the privacy of citizens? I don't really see that the argument that uh, you want to be GDPR compliant works in a country like China right now, this month, this year. Let's uh, get back to Dr. Young so he can reply. Uh, here we go. Go ahead, Dr. Young. Um, well, uh, we are technology people. We read uh, the uh, documents published by the, doc by the government and we compare the, the, uh, the words on GDPR and the words on this document. Uh, as for inferences uh, and uh, questions uh, that you asked, uh, I have uh, not put any thoughts into that. So let's just talk about the issue we have at hand, uh, technology. Thank you. Um, quick question on this. So, I mean, so is it difficult from, from, from a, the, the perspective of essentially a multinational company to deal with what essential national regulation, national definitions of different terms, you know, national implementation? How is it impossible to deal with all of that? It, it's very difficult, and it's what I mentioned in the introduction. But if you have a look at uh, what we've just heard about what's going on in China, if we look at what's happen, happening with the California Privacy Act, for example, which is coming out, which I would argue is probably not as well thought out as GDPR itself, but is, again, something that is out there to protect the interests. We will have to, again, solve for it. And, you know, again, this is where technology comes in, because what we're now doing across all of these rules and regulations that are coming out is having the machinery read them all now and cluster them into classes that we can now start acting upon to make sure that our machines abide by those sets of rules in each jurisdiction, and that can mean data transfer for some of it. It can mean actually where your computer is residing, which we, you know, is a constraint for us. And so part of that, you know, one of the allure of the cloud is that compute point. And that's a restriction for us. And we are, and you know, our CEO has been very public with how late we are to the cloud as a bank as a result of that. So that, in a way, has stymied some of the innovation out there, but we're getting there. Right? And it's just a question of understanding, absorbing, and making sure you can put the right, correct technology around it. And so I agree, the next generation of AI will have this fundamentally within its own systems. Puma, you wanted to react to that? Yeah, I was just going to say that ultimately it'd be nice to have a, have a fluid system, right? Where if I live in the UK, I'm Malaysian by nationality, traveling to the US, I, if I wanted to do a transaction there, it would be easy enough for, say, JP Morgan to draw down my data from the UK, to draw down my information from the Malaysian government. But it's not like that at the moment. Um, and I appreciate that that's an ideal that we would work towards. I still think the barrier remains that it, it goes down to the permissions of who gives um, who we give our permission to, to provide that private data. Um, Andreas, to your point about maybe the EFF being an institution, I mean, certainly from a, from a global financials perspective, perhaps one institution that might um, be able to undertake this kind of role could be the IOSCO. Uh, fact is, it's the organization that uh, acts as the supervisor or regulator for 95% of all central banks and supervisors around the world. So perhaps that is, they are an option. Um, institutions may well be the answer to provide that permissions and we allow them to take that decision for us, but I, I don't believe we're there yet. I don't think um, we have a global institution that will be able to do that for global citizens. So all that thought, because I want to explore that a little later in the panel, just exactly who can help. I want to ask you, Alexander, um, since you have worked on, on this, particularly in the European Union, how do you feel when people say that the, the lead that the European Union have in, in, in privacy is actually stifling economic growth? It's, it's detrimental to have so, such, if you like, draconian laws. Again, I think that's 
I just, again, like this, this, I think a couple of days ago, like the, the argument of stifling innovation is the, is the it's, it's kind of the thing that you take off, when you're out of arguments, you take it out of your head and then, oh, it's going to stifle innovation. Like innovation is like, you know, yes, it's going to be, it's going to be, oh, how? Like what is the reasoning? Like how in, how ensuring that everyone has, you know, trust in how the data economy is functioning going to be bad for innovation? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like are we saying that like, you know, food safety it's bad? Does, it, does food safety like stifle innovation in the food industry? Yep. No. Good so point. very fundamentally, I just, don't, like again, I don't see why we have to oppose one with the other. The most important part to me is really how do we make sure that from a regulatory standpoint, we, we set the rules and a baseline level of trust? And then how do we make sure that a lot of the technology that has been developed in the labs over the past 15 years are finally starting to be, to be used and combined to start building systems that allow data to be used while preserving people's uh, privacy. Tools like homomorphic encryption, tools like federated learning, tools like open algorithm, tools like differential privacy, tools like adversarial privacy and penetration testing. Anders. Yeah. I completely agree with you that the question is how can technology help us uh, to build environments that are basically working without trust? And um, then, of course, totalitarian regimes like China will do everything they can to suppress that. But how can we, and there are a number of crypto startups, how can we actually make sure that the data of the people and by the people is not used against the people, but for the people. How can we use technology to actually protect the people as opposed to, to uh, put them into prison? So let's talk about some specific solutions, right? To see, for example, if Alexander, I'll start with you. Uh, what are the technical solutions that we can call upon to achieve what you just said? Uh, is it secure multi-party computing, homomorphic encryption? What, what is it that you think could work in this, uh, in this case? I mean, to me, interestingly, so I teach uh, a course at Imperial on those technology that we call privacy engineering. Yeah. To me, very fundamentally, it's not like, you know, it doesn't have to be, you know, homomorphic, uh, you know, like uh, uh, secure multi-party computation, private set intersection, uh, different child privacy. It's fundamentally, those are the, you know, like base tool that you start combining to build a system that will allow the data to be used while preserving people's privacy. That is the first part. And then the second part, I think, to Andreas' point, it's really, to me, it's about learning from security. It's fundamentally how, after building the system, we can start literally testing its limit and see how resistant the system is to uh, attackers, to people who would try to, to game the system. You have a system, you have a certain level of trust, you don't want to rely only on trust, otherwise we could just all share data, like no need for security. And how strong should an attacker be to then be able to infer some information from the system? And truly, on the one hand, basic component, building a system, and then, and then really what we call adversarial privacy, which is really attacking the system actively to try to quantify the limits of, of the system and what it actually preserves. Andres, you agree, or is, is there more we can do? Uh, yeah, technical solution. I agree, and that technologies change. Uh, passwords, for example, uh, are a joke. I had my identity stolen one and a half years ago. Uh, it was a pretty busy week for me to <laughs> rebuild and to figure out what actually uh, was not compromised. So I think technologies change, and for us, for me, it is very important that people learn. People become more data literate. People become more privacy literate. And the course Eve is teaching, I think, is a great example for breaking it down to people who, in their daily lives, don't realize what they should be doing. So firstly, I'd say, just very quickly, your identity stolen to Andreas is out there. That could be a hit. <laughs> there is no... <laughs> we didn't have a room enough to contain two addresses, so we just uh, got one today. But what I would say as well is, 
you know, there are some, you know, we've got to actually get this technology explained to people well to this point, to make people a bit more uh, privacy literate. There's a great paper by the World Economic Forum that was out two Fridays ago that really talked about privacy in financial services and all the various techniques that are currently available. That's something that you should all be downloading and actually reading because the more that you can speak to your uh, friendly AI person or your friendly technologist about this, the better we will make the underlying technology behave. Actually, I just read yesterday a story about a lady in China who was locked out of WeChat, etc. And uh, she tried to get back in. Nothing worked. No more banking. No more Alipay. It turned out she had a nose job done. And the face recognition <laughs> said, that is not the nose we knew. No? There's a lesson there. Um, Tuma. <laughs> no guesses on who's done a nose job on this panel. <laughs> uh, none, I hope. Um, but very quickly, I, I think the point if I may extract from what's been said so far, is that awareness is the critical function of anything to do with AI and data and privacy. Because my big problem has been that actually citizens, leaders of corporates, corporates themselves, governments, and indeed um, uh, you know, any kind of institutional organization uh, generally does not have the necessary information and awareness to make those decisions. Uh, so quite simply speaking, I mean, sure, this was a few years ago, but Capture, that was utilized by one of the largest search engines in the world, uh, I believe everybody should know what this is. This is the human verification that you would be asked to put through uh, to prove that you're not a robot or not a software, to prove that you are human uh, when you log off or make payments on websites. Um, and I was a little bit startled when I was told that this was used to train that search engine company's AI function. Now, that's OK if that was made obvious. Uh, company X says, Puma Chemist, you are providing this information, you are saying this is X, Y, Z, 6, whatever, verifying this payment, uh, and at the same time, you're teaching our AI <laughs> capability to do better. That's okay, except I wasn't told. Uh, it's the fact that it's okay to teach AI. AI can exist together with privacy, but that information needs to be given. Awareness needs to be made for the citizen, the corporate, and indeed the governments. Um, I would like to bring Dr. Yang. I, I have a follow-up on that, but I'd like to bring Dr. Yang here on, on this topic. Dr. Yang, um, what, what is available already for practitioners to apply right now? Uh, what is it that a practitioner could use right now to do a lot of the things that the panel has already discussed? Right. Um, so, um, for example, uh, many of the technologies just mentioned, like uh, multi-party computation, secure, uh, secret sharing, uh, garbled circuit, uh, all, all these are terminologies that mathematicians and computer scientists have invented in order to encrypt data when they uh, communicate with each other. Uh, so in mathematics, it's a very rich field, but when you put these technologies to computing, unfortunately, they have been um, very inefficient. So not until recently has there been breakthrough in making more efficient versions of this technology. One of them is the so-called homomorphic encryption, which allows computation to be done in such a way that the computational engine may not have to know what's being computed, and yet they can carry out the computation. So in this way, the so-called deep learning system can process photographs without picking into the envelopes and, and know what the photographs look like, and yet can com complete the security requirement uh, for, for the purpose of the computation. So many of the, these things are happening. And um, so at IEEE, for example, we are setting up international standards to allow different um, organizations to follow the same language when they uh, build a collective system to, um, uh, for machine learning uh, under privacy. And um, in many of the AI top conferences, there are tutorials and workshops on so-called privacy-preserving 
uh, machine learning and data mining. And so, um, so this has become a very rich and new but rich field for AI researchers to get into. Yeah, so um, it's very promising. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Yang. Uh, of course. On that point, um, you know, we're investing heavily because we have an AI research lab uh, with a lady called Manuela Veloso, who, who you all know, who is le leading a whole field in data and cryptography for us. We are probably, I think, the first financial institution to have uh, PhD faculty, uh, or faculty awards and PhD fellowships looking at some of these things. But this is the big change for a lot of us in the room when you're working for financial institutions, is admit we can't build it all ourselves. And actually, that whole point about partnership, with it, which are the companies out there that are going to be able to accelerate to what we do in a trust, again, make sure we have the trust with those companies and form the right partnerships and properly invest some money such that we can accelerate this field. Right? That's what's really important because it's being investigated in various labs or in various universities without the actual practical application means that it will always stay as a hobby. We now need to bring it mainstream with, uh, with proper investment. And that's what we'll discuss in the next uh, part. You know, how do we bring in mainstream and what, what can financial services do to do just that? I just had one follow-up for you all on this issue that you have to educate the public about uh, their rights to privacy and so on. The question is how, because in, in theory, you're already doing it with these tremendously long uh, data agreements that nobody actually reads, right? So is there a different way that it's compliant, that it's legal? Is there a better way to do it, to bullet point this stuff? Or do you always have to read this? 50-page legal agreements. I can kick off. Please. Uh, so academic uh, entrenchment of interest uh, in the way that some, ec I mean, if JP Morgan's trying to encourage partnerships with universities, great scholarships, getting indi individuals that are aged, I don't know, 16 to 18 to realize that this is going to be a big industry and they will continue, need to continue to develop um, and be those bastions of trust for the future generations, right? So I think universities and academic foundations can certainly help. Mm. Um, falling flat on your faces can also help. Having your identity stolen, for example, Andreas, makes you that much more aware. Uh, and so hopefully that will be the plan Z rather than plan B or C into <laughs> making people more aware. But unfortunately, that is one way of learning. Uh, it does lead to an erosion of trust for sure whenever that happens. Uh, and as I think we've become an increasingly more suspicious society, we try to work out, well, how, do I, how does that get paid? Or, and that's actually a good thing. Being cynical is a good thing. But it does mean that we would tend to question more things. Um, and so that's, that's certainly one. Um, I would also say that reading up, I mean, books that uh, various authors or the panel or elsewhere have written, it's a fascinating subject when you see the intersections of um, knowledge coming together. Be, I, I'm not a data scientist, I'm a political economist by training and a lawyer, uh, but I find it an interesting topic. So taking an interest in the subject to protect yourself I think with self-preservation would be it too. So going out and reading books uh, written by interesting people and informing yourself could be, could be things. So three ideas there. Eve, Eve Alexander. Uh, yeah, I think I'll, learning from Andrea, I will address the second elephant in the room, which is like, how come at, I mean, we're, we've not discussed yet like the biggest, in my opinion, way we can improve things from a privacy perspective which is proper regulation and proper, proper enforcement. I mean, at some point, privacy is a fairly complex topic. There are a certain number of things that one can do to you know, pay attention and be careful, like good data hygiene, like every sense of you know, where your data is and where you're giving away data, permissions on your apps. But, but really fundamentally, I mean, I lead a research group. There's like, you know, eight of us at Imperial Nerds, like 100% of our time on privacy with a technical background. And I would not trust myself with understanding how my data is being used because most of it, I don't see it. Most of it really needs proper enforcement. And at some point, we will not get privacy unless there's a real threat and unless you have like, you know, properly staffed including technical people within data protection authorities to ensure that the rules are being enforced. 
Andreas, do you agree? Uh, proper enforcement is a solution or regulation is a solution? So I think it's very important uh, to educate people what the true trade-offs are and to uh, make them aware of the false trade-offs, the trade-offs that governments, companies make us believe exist, but ultimately are what you call their entrenched interests. I forgot you heard a word there, which was a good word. I just didn't know it, but it sounded right. Um, and uh, <laughs> getting people educated of understanding where they are being fooled, that somebody claims they, they need access to some data which they don't, it might make it more convenient for them, but it's not necessary. And where is it absolutely necessary? Anti-money laundering is a good example. Know your customer, uh, where we have to just uh, learn as people. We don't live in a village anymore where everybody knows who you are and that you didn't pay back that money or the piece of sausage you bought from Sunday before there was money. But now we live in a world which is very different. So how we actually learn, how we educate people, how we become privacy literate, data literate, I think is the most important task we have. And we should each ask ourselves, what we can we do uh, to make that move forward just by a little bit? And, and don't get me wrong, I think very fundamentally, I think there are a couple of topics around privacy that we need to have a debate as a society on, on what we think is okay and not okay. Absolutely. The only thing is once decisions have been made, we should not rely on the individual to try to do its best to preserve his privacy. No, I totally agree. In democratic societies, it is our job as citizens to negotiate the weights in front of these trade-offs. Um, I think that is uh, what we should be thinking about. How do we weigh the freedom of individuals, etc.? Yes. And adding to that, obviously, the freedom of the individual, going back to that point about regulation, though, you know, I think we've lived in a world where regulation has sometimes gone a bit too far as well on some of the opinions it's come out with. So we've got to make sure that as part of educating the people out there and things like that, part of what we have to do is educate the governments. It's appropriately regu regulated and make sure that it doesn't, doesn't get in the way of doing business in the right way because that's, I think, a very critical point that we all in this room probably think about as well. And so that's the issue, right? Uh, so as a regulated industry that enjoys the trust of a lot of its customers, financial services, who entrust you guys with their money and their business and their deals and all, what, what can you do and what can your regulators do to create, a, if you like, a global uh, detente over these issues? So the first thing, and again, I think we touched on it a little bit, is that coordination amongst a lot of the regulators so we can start having a global standard around what we think privacy should mean or some of the standards around the technological solutions. Um, so do, you agree, so, sorry, do you agree with Puma that IOSCO would be a good... So the IOSCO... Could be IOSCO and IOSCO... Yeah, it could be any of these large, um, large right. institutes or large uh, bodies that have been set up to help uh, govern these things. But ultimately, we need to make sure that companies that you're working with also, also go back to one of my original points, which is the ethics of data. Make sure that there are the right data use councils inside all of the firms to say, can I use the data for what I should be using it for? And make sure there is, you're building the right moral compass within an organization that can help when you speak to your clients, give them confidence, and thereby build up that body of trust that will also go to educate the standards. All right. Puma, on this point, do you think, as an observer of the financial service industry, that financial services firm can overcome their inherent rivalry, our rivalries, to work together on this? Or is there always going to be some sort of suspicion? I think if I can step out of it and take a bird's eye view for a minute there vis-a-vis -vis regulators first uh, with what Samik was saying, I think that's already happening, that regulators are coordinating perspectives and or setting trends. So if I may quote a couple, I believe the, the PRA and the MAS, for example, this is the Prudential Reg Regulatory Authority in the UK and the Monetary Authority of Singapore, more than possibly even three, four years ago, had come up together with the idea of uh, 
an efficient sandbox system, right? Where mm -hmm. um, innovation can be curtailed in one uh, area, but also made practical uh, in tranches. So I do think that regulators do play a role here and that they are trying to do their best uh, with encouraging innovation. Um, as for how it works amongst financial services firms, I think maybe infusing a third party might help. I mean, even at Cybos um, last year, which was my first Cybos in Sydney, I was amazed to see a very, very large, you know, one of the, the largest um, software company coming together with one of the big four uh, accountancy audit consultancy companies to put together this fabulous fintech program uh, at, that will help their respective client base. Uh, so I think maybe not just speaking amongst banks, uh, but infusing other uh, industries, uh, be it consultancies, um, not for uh, necessarily a complacency effect, but rather to create a confluence in, of information coming together to create fantastic products for our clients and our citizens and to protect their privacy at the same time. Does that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Andres, what do you think of that? A big tent, big tent where financial services firms come together with regulators, fintech. Does that, does that, do you think that would work? You know, a big coalition, if you like? You know, it's an old question about whether we expect the innovation from the big coalitions. And I was just in Dalian at the World Economic Forum. And that's, of course, what the people who are at the World Economic Forum make you believe that that's how it comes. And then I go back to Silicon Valley and work with my startups. And then that's what they, of course, make you believe. That is the three people crypto startup, which will change the world. So I think like in any dilemma, in this case, innovators dilemma. For me, in this case, the data dilemma or the privacy dilemma. In any dilemma, it is really both sides which have reasons as trying to negotiate a way out of it. Niva Alexander, how do you see this? What role would you like the financial services industry to play in this debate? Um, I think for me, and again, this is very much my uh, technical bias uh, here, is really, I think it's, at least in the past, I found it to be extremely useful to basically try to separate what, what we want and how we achieve it. And I think when it comes to regulation, one of the things, and data privacy, one of the things that I think is the most important is how do we have a global conversation on, on privacy, what matters, what we want to protect. And actually, I would argue, let's like, you know, keep the technology out. Really? Like, to not make the mistake of trying to be, like, you know, endorsing this technology or this technology or start to go into some of the technical uh, details, but much more, okay, what do we aim for? What do we want to get? What do we want to protect? And what those rules are, are clear, how do we achieve this from a technical perspective? So and where, there where we can start the using... Line? Where would you draw the line? Where would you draw that line? What do you want to protect? You know, how, how, who decides what you want to protect? The regulators and the politicians? Or who decides? I think we decide as a society. Like I, at some yeah. point, it is, it is yeah. like, what do, we, what, do, what do we care about? What are things that, thing that are okay? What are things that are not okay? What are the kind of inference that we are okay to make from a specific data set in the context of research that we are not okay using the same technology for other purposes. Like at some point, it's very much like we have a range of application and things that can be done with data. And, and, and back to your point on transparency, at what point are you not willing anymore to talk to your friends about what it does? Right? At some point, when are you not, when, when, when is, like, you know, at some point you, you draw, you, you cross a line in which most people would be like, this is, it's probably going too far. So it's very much, I think it's a conversation on what is possible, what is possible with data, what is possible with AI, what can we infer from data, what can we use data for, what do we think is okay and not okay, and only then, how do we ensure that the technology comes in to allow us to do the good without the bad? So just to play devil's advocate for a second, the debate, if you look at the debate now, there's billions of people using apps and technology that 
take data from them and they don't seem to mind. So the debate we're having is that we, the vast majority of society doesn't care about privacy, right? Including this room doesn't care. Right? They think the AI is going to win the day. So how do you reset the terms of the debate then? In, in why do we care for privacy? But they just use applications and technology that takes their data and they don't seem to mind. They tick the box and go on using some of those application technology. Yeah, but that seems to be like basically we are in, in the stage in which like, you know, either we think it's going to be okay, and for, for some people it is going to be fine. I've been in numerous settings in which I had people uh, tell me, oh, but, but I'm, I'm fine, I don't care for privacy. I'm like, yes, you don't. Like, you as, you as a person, you right. will probably be, you know, if, if a machine learning algorithm makes a decision about you, you will be on the right side of that boundary. And so, yes, it's okay for you. I mean, like, privacy is, is, is going way beyond just whether you care or not in a specific setup, right? So I, d I don't think that's really, really where it's much more the global issues. So let's take this back a little bit, right? So first of all, I think it's, privacy is something that we're learning. That is part of, a, part of that journey. When cars first came out, there were no speed limits on the roads, right? And over time, people realized that was a bad thing once they learned the sort of road, the death toll and things like that. So all of these types of things, as people get used to technologies, as people start working with technologies and start realizing some of the dangers involved, we evolve that privacy debate. We evolve each of these debates to get towards a sensible set of rulings. And that's ultimately where we are at today in that privacy debate. I think it's still early stages, but that's why we as firms and people like that need to continue to invest. And by one of your points earlier on, are financial institutions willing to share a little bit more than they did? I think we have to be a little bit more open with the types of things we do. Let's use the industry bodies, as we say, Cybot or um, the uh, AFMIs and all these types of things to help that happen. But understand that this is at sort of the early stages of this point. Oh, go ahead. Just two very quick points, if I may. One is that the problem remains that people don't know right. that, that privacy issue is being breached. They don't know enough, in my opinion. I don't know enough about capture, as an example, that was on this, um, on this search engine. Uh, or it, it could be anything. I mean, I, I, this was a con con controversy a couple of months ago when there was this profile on um, a major professional social media company um, <laughs> where there was a profile called Katie Jones that was created out of, a, I think, seven million faces. And this persona was created to then uh, make contact with senior leaders in U.S. government. Now, they accepted the invite and said, brilliant, I'll, you know, I'll extend my professional network, but it's scary that actually these individuals did not know that a fake profile could be created by um, an assailant that was trying to get their in personal information. So lack of information, I think, um, and awareness of that has been, has been the big issue, and that's what needs to be, to be brought out. And maybe it's by burning our fingers and saying, my identity has been stolen. My details have been picked out of my back pocket. Mm, I, don't, yeah. I don't know. Maybe that's the only way we can bring awareness. Uh, but there are other ways we, c we can accelerate, I hope, that information and, and corporations, not just financial services, because let's, let's remember this. Um, Amazon, Google, Facebook, they are just as much financial service firms as the incumbents of traditional banks may be. Uh, in different measures, sure. Yeah, I can see some echoes uh, frowning a little bit there. Uh, you know, but, but they do provide financial service um, services. Uh, they, they have credit cards. They provide uh, Apple Pay. I mean, there's all of these typical services we would associate with a bank, which has now moved hands to other corporations. And they, too, need to be under the same sort of uh, level-playing regulatory environment, I believe. I want to bring back Dr. Yang. It's a good point to bring him back because, of course, uh, we bank. Uh, so Dr. Yang, what do you think uh, um, financial services um, uh, in China can do to help this uh, global effort to, to tackle this issue? Um, yeah, um, I think, uh, as I mentioned earlier, um, financial services in China uh, is uh, very much aware and uh, and, and doing a lot uh, along with the international community 
such as building the international standard, uh, contributing to federated machine learning uh, technology, and so on. In China, there's a, a lot of um, uh, underprivileged uh, people living in countryside who uh, uh, require, a lot. so for example, small and medium businesses that uh, the very entire need for financial uh, help. Uh, but unfortunately, they are um, they are not they don't have a high profile. They don't have a, a long history, and so it's a matter of how you can reach out to them. And so to this end, there is um, um, marketing technology. There is um, technology search technology which you can uh, uh, all bring together using AI to identify them and to figure out that they have the, uh, the need and, and give a certain supply of, uh, of funds. So this is a special need in China because uh, there's a lot of rural areas and a lot of small and medium uh, companies, uh, mama and papa companies. And this is what the internet uh, banks um, are aiming at helping. Um, so I think this, this is a special uh, this special need will, will bring out a lot of uh, new uh, experience which we can we can bring to the world and, and people can share on this. Thank you, Dr. Yang. So we talked about a lot of stuff here. Uh, I would like, for the last part of this, to focus on the one takeaway you would like the audience to take with them once they leave the room. Um, so perhaps I'll start right. with you, Sami. What, what would you like the... Sure, yeah, so... You... Start with Dr. Yang. Yeah. Yes. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. If I put the, uh, a summary in one word, is that uh, privacy and AI are not necessarily contradictory to each other, because uh, the concept of uh, our understanding of privacy it is uh, getting deeper and deeper. Uh, so, with education, with awareness, our development of AI is uh, moving along with our understanding of, uh, of privacy as well. We have more technology to bear. Uh, so before, maybe a single machine, a, a single database uh, uh, can build a powerful engine. Uh, but today, uh, a distributed system with uh, security and privacy in mind can build an AI engine. So uh, the technology front will catch up or will, will um, uh, will allow privacy to be better pr protected along the timeline. Thank you. Go ahead. What's um, your take Very away? simply, I think the whole concept of research and development as a budget inside a bank has never existed. And if we are going to progress these types of agendas, people should start thinking about along those lines and actually truly get your institutions to put some money aside and put it behind programs such as this that will ultimately make it easier to use technology that we are using today. Eva Alexander. Yeah, I think I absolutely, absolutely agree with what, what was said. I think fundamentally, I'm, I'm glad to see that everyone agrees that it is a false trade-off. Like, it's a theoretical question. There are no need to pick between AI and privacy. You can get both. With good privacy, you can probably get a lot more AI. The solution exists. No, it's primarily, it's primary a question of starting to use and deploy them, including within banks. Andreas, your one takeaway for this session. So for me, the question is, what world do you want to live in? <laughs> Let's assume that we were tracked every moment wherever we go that facial recognition, emotion recognition, reads out how we feel about something, whether we know it or not ourselves. Assume you had all this data, then what would fairness be, for example, for a bank? So if we really knew everything about everybody, what would we do with it? I think that, for me, is a question we need to think about. Um, if we had all the data, if we had amazing predictive models, call them AI or whatever you want to call them, but then 
what is the objective function we want to optimize for. In the United States, in many cases, it is the objective function for companies, Amazon, Google, Facebook. In China, it obviously, clearly, is the objective function for the government. And here, maybe there's still hope in Europe that we do have an objective function. Me working with Angela Merkel, you working with the government as well. Maybe we still have some hope that we actually have an objective function where we try to optimize something for the individual, for the citizen, for the customer. Thank you. Boom. It's difficult to go after <laughs> such a philosophical <laughs> statement, but I shall try. Um, I, I, agree, uh, I totally agree um, with Dr. Yang, um, with Sumek, um, and certainly Yves Alexandre and Andreas, that privacy can be an AI and cloud computing can be complementary to each other rather mm. than contradictory. I think the concentric circles that continue to make us think about these areas, if I may summarize what Andrea said, are is the citizen, is the corporation, and is the government. And all three circles of interest, of individuals, will need to come together to formulate the next steps. The starting point for that is, even if we don't get full disclosure, full transparency, a better formulation of information needs to be put out there. And th that's the starting point. Without a proper understanding of what it is that we're giving our permissions for and what, it is, what sort of information is being collected on us, I don't think we can have a fair debate between the citizen, the corporation, and the government. It's fair. Um, I want to conclude to see, uh, to pose the question again, if you can have the lights on the, on the audience again. So uh, who is now... Who thinks now that privacy is going to prevail over AI, notwithstanding the fact that the panel doesn't think there's an open tension, but who thinks that privacy will prevail over AI? A show of hands. So a few more people, not that many more. And, so, and the rest thinks that AI, so who thinks that AI is going to prevail over privacy? Yeah, see, it's interesting. That's interesting. If you, if actually, can we ask who actually changed their mind yeah. in the last 55 minutes? <laughs> so... Ah. Okay, All right, well, one person, great. Some semblance of hope down there. <laughs> two people, two people, which is well one worth. mind at a time. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's a good education. Good issue of time. Um, okay, well, I think that's all. That's pretty much all we have time for. So, if you wouldn't mind uh, uh, showing your appreciation for the panel, work very hard for this. Uh, I think it was a very hopeful discussion. I thought it's going to be a lot more. Tension is a very friendly discussion. Hopefully, we can leave you with a message of hope that the financial services industry is going to be proactive in doing some of the things we discussed here and kind of squaring the circle between the corporation, society, and government. So, thank you very much for attending. Enjoy Cybos. And thank you. Thank you. <laughs>